My name is Sibylla Steiner. I am a partner in the employment team of uh, Wayne Mitchell, and I am joined today um, by my colleague Joe Mosley, who is our professional support lawyer. Um, thank, before we start, um, just a few housekeeping issues. Um, if you would like to ask us some questions, if you could uh, do that online. Um, there should be a Q&A button on your screen. So if you could type your questions in there and we will try to answer um, as many questions as we, as we possibly can. Now we are in unprecedented times um, and we all find ourselves in situations as employers and employees um, where there are a lot of questions which um, we, at the, we, where we, need to, we need answers and we need answers quickly. We're trying to answer those questions this afternoon, but I think I should add that there are still many, many, many unclear um, points and issues in this context, in this situation. What I would like to start with is, is with saying that unless there are changes in legislation, and there are some temporary changes, and we will be touching on those um, in the course of this webinar, the usual employment rules and laws continue to apply. So they have not fallen by the wayside. They are still there um, and they need to be complied with. One of the main issues that we have been advising in the last few weeks is in relation to the coronavirus job retention scheme, which the Chancellor announced on Friday the 20th of March 2020. So that's only now been in place for about a bit over three weeks. Now, the initial aim of this team was to make sure that employees do not have to be made redundant, but that employers can keep them on the payroll despite employers um, not necessarily being in a position to pay them because of the pandemic situation that we've found ourselves in. <clears throat> now, there has been further guidance recently, and that seems to indicate that the group of employees that could be furloughed um, might be wider um, than initially thought. So my, my first question is, the way, way, way we're setting it up is that, that Joe and I are going to talk about the questions that, that you have very kindly sent in. Thank you very much for that. Um, and then at the end of it, if there are further questions that have come up, we, we'll try to deal with those as well. So. My first question, Joe, is who, who can actually be furloughed under the coronavirus job retention scheme? The simple to answer to that, Sabilla, is practically anybody. The re key requirement is that you are um, an employee or worker, someone who has got a PayYE um, tax code, so you're already taxed as if you're um, a worker or an employee, and you're on the payroll as at the 28th of February. So what does that mean for someone who, say, accepted a job offer on the 25th of February and is then starting on the 5th of March? Will they be able to be furloughed? We don't think so, no, which is most unfortunate. Um, the, gov the government have said that they needed to have a particular cut-off date to prevent fraud, and they have chosen the 28th of February for that purpose. Therefore, we think that if you're not actually physically on the payroll on that date, your employer will not be able to furlough you. And do we know whether that means that you've actually got to be on the payroll on that day? So, for example, if someone started on the 20th of February and then the next payroll is in is in March. Would that mean that that person can't be furloughed either? I think it means 
if they're actually put on the payroll. So as long as they've physically been added to the payroll on or before the 28th of February, we think they'll be okay. But there's a real gray area around that, that particular question, I'm afraid. One of many. Yes, indeed. And what about um, people on zero hour contracts and, and fixed term contracts? Can, can they be furloughed? Yep, yeah, in theory, um, absolutely, they can be um, they can be um, furloughed. I mean, I'm not sure how many employers are actually furloughing people on on zero hour contracts because, as you know, if you're subject to a um, zero hour contract, your employer doesn't have to offer you any hours at all. That said, it's it's you know some employers we know definitely are still um, furloughing their zero hours cut contract staff, absolutely. And for fixed term contract staff, it's exactly the same principle. Yes, um, you can be furloughed, even if it means that the furlough takes you beyond what your fixed term would have been. And we also are getting a lot of questions about people who were made redundant or resigned um, and are now asking, and employers are asking that as well, well, can, can we be put back on the payroll of our previous employer so that we can be furloughed because we can't be furloughed um, with the new employer because we only started in, in March, so after the 28th of February. Yes, yeah. that's one of the things that the government have made very clear. They, they submitted some more guidance over the weekend um, to answer some of the questions that we didn't have answers to, and that was one of them. And the answer to that is yes, in theory, again, if you were made redundant before the 28th of February, you can ask your old employer to take you back on their books. They're not obliged to do so, but you can certainly ask. Um, and sorry, what was the other question you asked me? Um, now, I, I think that was the question, and maybe sort of what considerations might an employer have um, when they are considering whether to take someone back on? Um, was well, less Sure. I mean, one of the major considerations for um, employers is the fact that if you take somebody back on, then their continuity of employment is preserved. And obviously, if you've got somebody that didn't have two years service at the point that you let them go, um, if you furlough them, they can then develop that two years service, which means that it's a different ball game when you eventually come to dismiss them, if indeed that, that becomes your, in, your intention. I mean, no one really knows really what's going to happen in the future, but if, it, if your business has suffered um, a decline and you are looking to make redundancies after furlough, then you will have to include those people in the groups of people that you consult with. It may therefore cost you more money. Yep. Okay. Um, let me put one to you then, um, Sibylle. Somebody has asked about if um, there's no work to be done at all except voluntary work and training. Can you please explain what the rules are about um, both doing voluntary work and or training if you're furloughed? Yes, I will. I think the first starting point is that, that only people can be furloughed who are actually not going to do any work. So. Um, there are often questions about can we furlough employees um, who do 50% of the work, so have reduced their work, um, and can then there be a top-up under the furlough system? And the answer to that um, is, is no to that. Now, what can be done um, during the furloughing? So it, it, um, the guidance there says that it can be, there can be voluntary work or employees can be doing training. Now, what, what would count as voluntary work? I, I don't think what counts is, for example, if an employee says, okay, I'm furloughed now, but I'm now going back to my, my own employer and I'm going to do my work on a voluntary basis. I, I we don't think that that is possible um, because that would be work that would assist um, the employer, that would provide services to the employer where the that's on a voluntary basis um, or not. Now, as far as the training is concerned, um, again, the guidance there specifically allows for training. Um, there is a question I would have thought, what, what sort of 
type of training there is and, and how much training um, someone can do. If, if the training is the main part of, um, of the employment contract and it's something that the employee does sort of would be doing day in, day out, I think the question arises there whether that would be a furloughing situation. But generally, um, the guidance says that, yes, uh, training, training should be possible. Um, another question that arises in that context, and I think I might mention it here rather than um, when we come to speak about how are these wages and they've been calculated. Um, if an employee has been asked to do training, and that is an employee whose wages are close to the national minimum wage, then at least for the training part of what the employee does, um, the employer needs to talk that up so that the employee for the training he does will get will get the national um, minimum wage. Yeah. The, yeah. the next question that, that that we often get in that context is whether one can work for another employer um, while being furloughed by one employer. And again, the new guidance um, seems to say that that is indeed possible, always assuming that the employment contract with the employer who does the furloughing actually allows for the employee to work for another employer at the same time. Um, presumably, the employment contract will not will definitely not allow for the employee then to go off and work for a competitor while being furloughed by his or her own employer. Um, but if it is another business, another employer that doesn't have anything to do um, with, the, with the first employer who has furloughed the employee, I would have thought that the first employer would probably agree for the employee to work for someone else. However, I think... I think yes. Yeah. Sorry, I was just about to say, I think that's true. I think that you're probably more likely to come into that sort of situation if, say, for example, you were working in... I don't know, a, a closed shop, for example, you've been furloughed from that shop um, because everything's been closed down. I'd be really surprised if an employer in those circumstances would turn down your request to pick strawberries or, you know, do something of that nature, even if it be even work somewhere like Tesco's. Um, and the odd thing about the scheme is that you can actually receive your furloughed wage and any additional earnings that you receive from a new employer. So, in theory, you could earn up to £5,000 a month, even though in, you're furloughed. In, indeed. Um, what the first employer, I think, should, however, make clear, um, and, and that should probably be done in the furloughing letter, is that as soon as the furlough situation for the first employer ends, the, the employee has to come back um, because the first employer does not want to find itself in a situation where the um, employee says, but I'm now actually still continuing working for my second employer, so I can't come back. So that is something that needs to be clarified and agreed um, between the, the furloughing employer um, and, and the employee. Now, I think that that also gets me to, to the question you know, as to how what, what sort of is the length of period um, that someone can be furloughed for, or indeed should be furloughed for? Yep, I'll answer, I'll answer that, and I'll also go through a couple of questions about redundancy that I've just seen appeared on the, appear on the screen, so that we don't lose people um, too much at, the, at this stage. Um, so the minimum period that you can furlough a member of staff is three weeks. So you can um, furlough somebody for a three-week period only, or you can furlough them and just wait and see what happens. The scheme itself is going to be open initially until the end of May, and most furlough agreements that I've seen have left the, left the amount of furlough completely open so that an employer can extend that if, easily if they want to. Would it be okay if I go through the redundancy questions now that have been asked? Yes, please. Yes, please, okay. if you could do that, that would be great. Thank you. Somebody has asked, what happens if I was made redundant after the 28th of Feb? Well, that wouldn't be a problem at all because you would still be on the payroll as at 28th of Feb. Therefore, if you have already left your employment, 
then you again could ask your employer to take you back on. The call has hung up. This caller was brought to you by WeQ for You. To save time and money on your mobile phone bill, search for WeQ for You on Google Play or App Store and install our award winning Five Star app for free. To answer more callers at your call centre, visit weqforyou.co.uk. Would you mind muting it, please? It's at least one of our. Um, and, the, and the next question was about um, if you've been made redundant and received a redundancy pay, do you have to pay this back before being furloughed? Well, the guidance doesn't cover this at all, but it, it makes sense to me um, that if you're asking your employer to take you back and then furlough you, there would be a reasonable expectation on your employer's part to actually say, well, okay, but I'd like the money that I gave you um, in respect of the redundancy back birth, particularly, if, particularly any redundancy payment, the notice period may well have um, been swallowed up anyway. Um, if you're not willing to pay that back, then I can imagine your employer will say, no, they're not going to um, put you back on furlough. Obviously, if you pay the money back and are then subsequently made redundant, then a redundancy payment would be um, offered to you again in, in those circumstances. I'm just going to check if there's anything else come through on redundancy while I'm still at it. Um, let's have a look. Consultation, 27th of Feb. This is another redundancy question, and redundancy date was 27th of March. Um, so you weren't on payroll at that particular point. I think I'm right in, in saying, aren't I, um, Sibylle, that in those circumstances, you wouldn't be covered because you're not on the payroll as of 28th of February. Oh, Sibylle, we've lost you now. I'm sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, no, so I agree with what, what you've said there. Um, if you weren't on the payroll, um, then that wouldn't be possible. Okay, well, I think we've answered all of the other questions that have come up in relation to redundancy. Right, let's go, let's go through some of the questions then that we were already, that were asked in advance. Where have we got to, Sibylle? Yeah, I think we've, we, we, we've now got a few questions as to what um, happens what 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 the employer has to ask or has to ask the employee to do in in order for the employee to be furloughed um right. yeah and the the question there is well can that be imposed on the employee um unilaterally by the employer and the answer to that is no um so um there ought to be agreement on the part of the employee to uh to agree to the furlough um, and what we advise to do in that context is, is to prepare a letter um, for the employee to, to read, to sign, um, and to agree that um, they may not be happy, but that they can be put onto the furlough scheme um, by, their, by their employer. Okay. And how... how how do you how do you choose who to furlough? Um, does one have to furlough everyone, or, or is there a way of finding who should be furloughed and and who shouldn't? Well, you certainly don't have to furlough everybody, and most businesses are even if they've closed down are keeping a core group of um, people engaged in order that they can react quickly when everyone gets back to work. It's actually quite a tricky question. Um, my view is that you're likely to want to furlough your least productive people. And you may also want to protect members of staff that you know have someone that's vulnerable within their, within their household. So if they've got somebody within the high risk group, you may want to furlough those to protect them and the people that they share a house with. You may also want to furlough individuals within your organization or business who are having to juggle childcare as well. So, um, you know, you, you can do all of those things um, to, the, to the 
the extent that it may be considered to be discriminatory, say, for example, if you choose to furlough everyone with a childcare responsibility, it may be that that disproportionately um, favours women rather than men, although possibly not in these days. But let's say for argument's sake that it does. You would still have the opportunity to be able to justify that in law. And I think that in most circumstances, you will be able to do so, provided you were able to show that you had a very cogent reason for choosing the people that you did um, in order to protect them or assist them in order that they can look after their children or people within their household. And I think we're coming back to the point that we made earlier there, that um, the usual employment rules continue to apply, um, so that these, these, these points need to be considered. And should there be litigation arising from this, um, the courts will look at this very carefully and, and very closely. Um, I do think that we can probably say that the that the court would consider the situation that the, the business employers find themselves in at the moment, um, but they would not be impressed with um, total disregard of of anything in 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 this context. No, that's true. That's true. I had another question actually in relation to this, and that is in relation to. Um, people that look after their children who are not at school. And the question is, can you confirm that the employer has to agree this and staff can't demand to be furloughed? Well, the simple answer to that is yes. The, um, who you decide to furlough is, the, is a question for the employer. Anybody that is then asked to furlough can agree or decline the, the request. Thank you. Um, I, I've got, before we go back to the legal questions, I've got a few questions here saying that we cannot be heard. So if I could please ask our technical team um, to, to, deal with, to deal with those issues and maybe respond to those questions, I would be extremely grateful. Um, coming back um, to the, um, the question as to how to choose who to furlough, um, what, what about, what do you think about um, employees being on long-term sick? What, is that possible for them to be furloughed or presumably not? My understanding of the guidance is that if you're in receipt of SSP, um, then you aren't eligible to be furloughed. But once you're off SSP, you can be furloughed. Um, and I, I suppose what that um, suggest is that in some cases people that have been on long-term sick may ask to come back into work in order that they can be become furloughed. And I think we're starting to see um, requests like that, aren't we, Sibylla? Yes, indeed. Yep. I think the question in relation to, somebody's asked a question in relation to people that are living in households where someone is shielding and whether they can be furloughed. Now, up until this weekend, we weren't really sure about the answer to that because it looked as if, um, in those circumstances, employers didn't really have to do anything cause if they didn't want to. And I know a lot of employers are and were, were actively supporting those members of staff, but not everyone was. And I think the guidance now makes it much clearer that if you are living in a household with someone who is shielding, and people that are shielding are asked to stay at home, not go outdoors at all, apart from medical um, emergencies or to see a, a, a doctor for 12 weeks. Um, in those circumstances, um, individuals that are living with them, so if you employ somebody living with somebody that is shielding, they can be furloughed too. And that would be a great relief, I think, to many people that were yeah. worried about continuing to work um, and putting the people that they live with, their lives at risk in some cases. I know I've got a friend whose husband works in a supermarket who is considered to be a key worker. She um, very sadly is suffering from cancer and they have been worried to death about, you know, the fact that he could be bringing the virus into their house. Um, this, the guidance this weekend has brought some relief to them. I mean, that no, said, the employer still has to agree, but I think in those circumstances an employee um, would certainly have a, a good argument to ask to be furloughed, particularly if 
the organisation is furloughing other members of staff too, even though even if they might not otherwise have allocated yeah. them for the furlough scheme. Yeah. Presumably, though, if if that um, if if that employee can work from home, and if there is if the employer would like the employee to continue to work from home in that situation, um, then that wouldn't be a problem, and payment would continue as normal. Absolutely. Yeah, government guidance guidance is very clear on that. It says that if you can work from home, you should work from home. Um, I think when we're talking about these sorts of people, we're talking about people that are being asked to go into their work. So, you know, key workers, for example, road workers. Every time I nip to the shop, I see somebody, you know, work, working on potholes at the moment. Construction workers, there's still an awful lot of those in work. Lots of people still are out there in the workplace that are not technically key workers. I've got a question here that might be, that I can put to you, I think, Tam Sibylla. If an employee has resigned and is now, now wants to take advantage of the furlough scheme and wants his resignation taken back, what's your advice? Um, I think if the employee wants to do that, um, they can certainly speak to the, to the business from which they have resigned. Um, there is no obligation on that business to accept the withdrawal of the resignation. Um, and I think as we discussed earlier, there are a number of considerations that the business is likely to take into account, um, namely what's going to happen, what, what will we agree? Will we just agree for the notice period to be extended? Will we agree for the resignation to be withdrawn completely? Um, and the, I think both parties need, need, in a way, to think to think ahead as to what is happening after the furloughing, after the furloughing scheme, um, will will the employee then maybe have have two years um, length of service? Um, maybe the employee would like to continue, but but that is then something that the business needs to consider whether they would like the employee to continue despite the fact that they have resigned. Yeah, I think the thing to bear in mind is that if you have resigned and your employer has rubbed their hands with glee and thought, great, I've got rid of him or her, you've got zero chance of persuading them to furlough you, bring you back on um, the books and furlough you. I think that's probably correct, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, shall we move on to pay then now? Because we've, got, we've had a few queries come in about pay. There's um, stuff about um, commission, all sorts of things. So can I ask? by um, asking you, Sibylla, to first of all talk about what makes up the 80% of pay, please. Okay. So what under furlough the employee is entitled to receive is 80% is of the wages or £2,500 per month, whichever is, whichever is the lower. So how, how are these 80% to be calculated? Again, um, following the updated guidance from the government that we received last Friday in the mm -hmm. evening, um, there is a bit more clarity now. So it does mean the normal pay. Um, it now also possibly means, it also means now, um, well, the guidance says fees, it's not quite clear what is meant by fees, but it also refers um, to earned commission payments, which can now be included in those 80% as well. Now, what cannot be included are non-cash benefits, say, um, are, for example, or private health insurance, um, that cannot be included in, in those 80%. And also the 80% is a, that's a gross amount, so the employee will have to pay tax and national insurance contributions with, on that. Um, and the employee also will have to make um, the employee pension contribution. Now, for the business, for the employer, so they can claim back those 80%, and the business also can apply for a grant to cover the employer national insurance contributions and also the employer minimum um, pension auto enrollment contributions, which at the moment for the employer is, is, is 3%. Now, if an employer pays more than 
the the minimum pension or to enrollment contributions that will not be covered um, by this by this following scheme, and the employer um, will have to pay those on top. Okay. Can I ask you what your view is about the updated guidance about commission? Because it's still a little bit ambiguous. When I first read it, I thought that what it is saying now is that if you're entitled to contractual commission payments rather than discretionary commission payments, then that should be included. Is that, is that your view? Um, that, that is my understanding as well. Um, it, it does say anything discretionary will not be covered. Um, it mentions discretionary bonuses are not included as well. Um, so, yes, that is my understanding as well. Um, the other question I think in relation to that is with, with regard to overtime. Um, how, is, is that likely to be covered by the 80 percent? Um, I mean, guaranteed overtime would have been covered anyway, um, but what type of overtime might be covered in addition to that? Um, usual overtime, again, still a slightly gray area. I think probably the case, and it's a big caveat here because the government hasn't been clear, but I think what actually what actually will happen is that if you're somebody whose pay varies each month anyway, then the government has already said that you can do an averaging provision. Now, that will include regularly worked overtime anyway. If you're on a salary and on a fixed amount, then that's taken um, as at your payroll, so whatever you were paid on the 28th of February. So if that was a period where you didn't receive any overtime, I don't think that you can you can subsequently claim it in your 80%. I think that's how it works. I, I think that 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 is how it works. Um, it might be slightly different where someone has um, where the pay varies, um, and then has yeah. the, that if you if you calculate back, that then may include um, some type of over time. Yeah, so the person that's asked me about estate agents and commission, I think it very much depends on how they are how they are usually paid. So if they their pay varies, as I guess it probably would do if you're subject to um, commission payments, then you would be able to take those into consideration and they would be averaged in line with government guidance. If however there is a salary scheme um, then possibly not unless there is already a, a commission payment that was due and payable on 28th of February or in the 28th February payroll. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to have a quick look and see if there's anything else yeah. on pay while we're here. I, yeah, I think that there, 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 um, there are questions here as to whether it is possible to wait for the government to make these payments um, or whether employees um, should be paid on their usual pay roll dates. Um, my view there is, and and I'm interested to hear Joe, what 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 you're thinking is that the starting point should be that employees are paid um, by the employer on the on those usual dates because the the payment will not be made by the government to the employee, but it will be paid to the employer. Now, if an employer finds finds itself in a situation where they just simply haven't got the funds to pay. Um, then, it, from a practical point of view, um, they, they will have to wait for, for those grants to come in. Um, and again, my suggestion there would be that um, this is dealt with in the furloughing letter so that it, it is explained to the employee and that the employee agrees to it. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, Talking about the um, the furloughing letter, we've got a question here where um, that employees have been sent the letter, but they haven't actually returned it, um, oh, okay. and haven't returned it signed. Um, and what the situation there is, um, I think my first thought is that obviously, with everything being virtual at the moment. Um, it might be an idea to sort of follow up with an email to ask the employee or employees concerned whether they confirm, confirm by email. 
Um, if they still don't confirm, what is your view? Can it be assumed that they have agreed? Um, is silence can silence be regarded as agreement? Not necessarily. It could also be regarded as working under protest, couldn't it? And then they might try mm -hmm. yeah. to recover the um, rest of the money after the furlough scheme ends. My my preference, I think, would be to give give them actually pick up the phone and speak to them and say, look, you've not signed the letter because presumably you've sent a letter after they've agreed anyway. So you will have a record of their agreement. And if they confirm to you again that they are agreeing to it, I'd just make a note of that and not worry too much about the formalities if it's, if it's proving difficult. As long as you've got a record that they have agreed and they haven't then in, in the interim sent you an email or a message saying, actually, I'm not agreeing to this, I'm only doing it under protest, I think you're, you're pretty okay. Yeah. And I think the new guidance there also says that, that these sort of agreements and consents, they need to be kept by the employer for at least five years. I um, do, yeah. So, something. so, so or any note or anything that's made in, in the context of this um, should be added to that pile of papers, I suppose, and that that should be kept, that that should be kept for, that, um, for that period of time. Um, I think we're going to move on to holidays in a minute. Indeed. Indeed. Before we do, as that's such a hideous topic, um, let me just go through some of these other queries that have come through. Um, yeah, so. I, I think on the holiday question, Joe, the sort of main thing is can it can holidays accrue during furloughing? Um, and I think the 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 million dollar question at the moment is can employees take and can they ask to retake holidays? why they're being furloughed and okay I'll, um, I'll talk about holiday now then but we do yeah. need to get we can get to some of these other other questions um because they're asking us for clarification on some of the things that we have gone through but yes holiday is incredibly holiday important. First, then, yeah. yeah okay H holiday issue is incredibly important and it's one where the guidance is completely silent absolutely nothing in there at all we think um, I think certainly this is the safest um, option, mm -hmm. is to assume that holiday does accrue even though people are not working. Um, that follows the normal principles, really, that um, if you're sick, for example, then holiday will still accrue. Now, I think there's an argument that um, because you're sitting at work, you're not sick, you've just not, not got anything to do. There's a possibility that somebody will argue uh, at some point that um, holiday doesn't accrue. And I've certainly seen other law firms say that um, they don't think holiday accrues. But I think given the thrust of the European court um, guidance in relation to holiday, we have to assume that it does. The government certainly haven't said otherwise, and I would have expected them to have done so if they are saying that, not least because they've already tweaked the working time regulations to allow um, staff to carry over up to four weeks holiday um, in their current holiday year if for reasons relating to the coronavirus they aren't able to take all of their holiday this year, whatever that year is. For most people it would be January to December. So you've got two, two years to take that leave if you aren't able to take it this year. Now, the other question was, um, let me just find it, I've got it on my screen somewhere. Yes, but, um, right, it, we've also been asked a lot of questions about whether or not you can actually take a holiday, and I, I use that in its loosest sense, because no one is taking a holiday at the moment, we're all effectively under house arrest. But the question that has been asked is whether or not you can actually ask your staff take a holiday whilst they are furloughed, um, or whether staff can ask to be um, on holiday whilst they are furloughed. And the reason why staff might ask um, is because when you are on holiday, then your wage must be topped up. So you wouldn't be able to pay holiday at the 80% level. You would have to pay it at their normal rate. So that would include things like regularly worked overtime, commission payments, all of the usual stuff that applies to holiday will apply um, dur you know, during this period too. Bear in mind, of course, that if you 
as an employer only include overtime and commission payments in the first four weeks, you can continue to do so as well. Now, the question about um, whether you whether taking holiday break the furlough period, it, there's, there's absolutely no guidance on that at all. And our advice airs on the side of caution in, in, on this one. Um, and we're telling people that if you have you should have a minimum period of three weeks, and then if you want to, you can ask your staff to take some of their holiday and then re-furlough them, because as we've said earlier, you can um, put people in and out of furlough. Um, and for, for many people, the, the big question will be what happens this weekend, because of course we've got bank holiday on Friday, it's Good Friday, and then we have Easter Monday. And for many people, they are taken as part of their holiday allocation. Um, ACAS originally said that the idea of being on holiday and being furloughed was incompatible, so either had to be one or the on one or the other. They've now changed that advice slightly and seem to be suggesting that you can you can take a holiday whilst you're also furloughed. But until that question is properly answered by the government, our view is that it's better to be safe than sorry. Um, and make sure that anybody that you furlough is actually at home, not on holiday, um, for that first three-week period. And I think that's probably about as much as we can say with any confidence on that subject at the moment. Um, we are expecting at some point for the Department of Business, Industry and Enterprise to produce some more detailed guidance. But who knows, at the moment, the government and certainly HMRC seem to be um, giving out information via Twitter. Um, and that's no way in which to you know, form decisions, either if you're an employee or an employer. In, indeed. Um, and I think just to, to add to that, um, where, because the situation is, is unclear, um, I think we, we, we have been asked not just the question, can the employee take a holiday, but, but can we actually ask the employees um, to take holidays during the furloughing period? Um, I mean, first of all, the general rule presumably applies that um, an employer can ask an employee to take a holiday, but the notice do so should be twice as long as the holiday taken. Um, yeah. Then se separate from that is, is the question, well, as, as a business, can we um, can we combine it? Because we don't want then everyone, uh, when it's allowed to go to the beach again and, and to fly to other countries uh, in the second half of the year, then, then suddenly be away. Um, so I, I think um, if that decision is made, yes, no, we do want to ask people to take holiday during furlough, and to, to stuff all the holiday into that period, um, I think it needs to be borne in mind again, coming back to what, what would a court, how would a court see that? How would a court judge that? Um, would they be impressed if the employer just tries to, to you know, to, to, to get everyone to take the holiday at the same time? And I think that's something that needs to be considered and weighed um, while the advantages and possible risks um, in future litigation need to be, need to be weighed I think, out. I think that's a really good point, actually, because although it might be tempt for employers to think, right, okay, they're sitting at home anyway, let's get them to take all of their holiday whilst they're on furlough. Um, the reality is sitting at home um, at the moment is not the same as taking rest and relaxation from work. And I, I think that if, if you did that, then it may undermine the implied duty of trust and confidence and I'm not sure that a tribunal would be impressed that actually somebody has been able to take their holiday. You don't need to be sitting on a beach in order to take a holiday, but you do need to have rest and relaxation. And I'm not sure that anybody, even if they are furloughed, can honestly say that they're getting rest and relaxation at the moment. It's a pretty tense time for, for most people. And if you're also juggling homeschooling and all the rest of it on top of that, then, then that, that's a tricky one. So. Um, as I say, we don't know what the answer is anyway in terms of whether you can combine the two. But if you do decide to ask staff to take some holiday during their period of fellow, don't ask them to take it all. Yeah. 
Indeed. Um, I, I think, shall we have a look at some of the questions that, that have now come in? Um, it's 10 to 3, so that we can deal with what, yeah. what, has, been, what has been sent in. I've got um, one here that says, if you've been self-isolating due to being over 70 years old, can you be furloughed or are you only entitled to SSP? You're actually not entitled to SSP unless you are self-isolating in accordance with um, medical guidance. Lots of people who are over 70 years old are just following government guidance. They don't have coronavirus symptoms and they're not self-isolating because they live with somebody that does. It's only in those circumstances where SSP is payable. So my view would be if you've got somebody in that category, then you ought to think about furloughing them if you can, because that will be the only way in which they'll get income during this period, um, other than if they take paid holiday. Thank you, Joe. Um, I've got a question here with regard to the um, to the wages, the and the eight percent, and a possible top up. Um, now there is no obligation for those eighty percent um, to be topped up. Um, of course, that um, that can be done, but um, as I say, it doesn't have to be done. Um, if the employer decides to top up then the employer will not be able to reclaim the top up under the furloughing scheme, um, but the employer will only be able to claim the 80% or the £2,500 two uh, two, two £2 per month, with whichever is the lower. So the 2500 that's sort of calculated on the, on the sort of median salary of £30,000. So if there is an employee who earns less than £30,000, then that employee will be entitled to the 80% of, of the wages. But if there's an employee who earns more, 40 or 50,000, then that cap of 2,500 will, um, will come in. But whatever the employer decides to pay as a top up, that will not be able to be reclaimed under the, under the government scheme. Okay. I've got another one here about pre booked annual leave. Um, should they be paid for the holiday or told to cancel it? Well, their employer could um, cancel it um, by giving them notice that that's, that's what they want them to do, in which case they'll remain on the furloughed wage. If they don't require you to cancel it, then you should be paid your normal pay. Now, we don't think that should be based on the 80%. We think that should be based on your normal pay. So pre-furlough, if you earn, I don't know, £500 a week and um, you took a week's leave during furlough, then you should receive £500 a week, not 80% of £500. Yeah, I think we believe, though, yeah, I think we're probably um, awaiting guidance there as well. Um, it might come, it might not come. It might say um, that it only has to be the furlough to pay, but we simply don't know at this point. It's the same as we to pay the normal pay. Yeah. Um, there is a, I, I've had a question here whether there's any indication as to when the money will be paid by the government. Um, I, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. The portal is not up and running yet. Um, that is likely to, when I say portal, I mean HMRC portal where um, you can register the employees that, you, that, that, that have been furloughed. Um, that is supposed to open, I would say, the second half of April, um, and then we will see how quickly the, the claims can be um, can be dealt with. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add to that is that the government don't have a great track record when it comes to IT projects. Um, they do say that they are still committed to meeting the deadline of the end of April, but we'll we'll have to wait and see. That will that you know that can be a that will be a huge concern to employers that are funding these things out of their own pockets in very difficult times, and equally so to employees um, where their employers haven't been able to pay them. There may well be a wait. We don't know. Yeah, I think it's probably safe, it's safe to assume that money will not be paid on the 30th of April. I think it will take some time. Um, yeah. And talking about the IT issues, fingers crossed that the portal will not collapse um, 
on the day yeah. it opens because so many people are trying to use it. Right, somebody has asked us again, there seems to be a bit of confusion around the date of the 28th of February. Yeah, this that question was just is going to that as well. yeah. Yeah, the guidance is unclear. Initially, it refers to being on payroll, but later it refers to being employed on or after 28th of Feb. My understanding is that you need to be on payroll as at the 28th of February. Yeah, that, 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 I mean, that is a, I think it's an extremely important question and because it does seem to be unfair if someone starts on the, say, the 24th of February and the next payroll payment is in March, that person did start before the 28th, but might not practically have been on the payroll yet. So um, I think that is still one of the gray one of the gray areas, but there is a potential risk that they might these people might not be covered. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're advising people in those circumstances is that you might be able to claim for them, but it will very much depend on. Um, whether you're required to um, sign a declaration when you submit your claim for your furloughed staff. Because if it is, if the, the question is very specific and it asks you what were all of these employees that you are claiming for on your payroll as of 28th of February, then you wouldn't be able to include them because you'd be telling, a, you know, you'd be telling a lie. If, however, it's phrased a bit more ambiguously than that, you may well be able to include them. Um, but bear in mind that when HMRC eventually unravel this scheme, um, and it looks as if they're, they're planning on doing, doing so and giving themselves about five years to look into um, payments that have been made, they could recover the money if they believe that it's been um, claimed inaccurately. I think one of the questions that we had actually um, that came in, they said, what happens if somebody has been put on furlough um, and their employer has either persuaded them work, which obviously is in breach of furlough conditions, um, who, who pays the money back? Is it employee or employer? Well, my view is that it would have to be the employer. The money is paid to the employer. They are the one that is accounting to HMRC for it. And if they have made a mistake, then they would have to pay it back, not the employee. Yeah. No, I think and I, I agree with that. Sorry. I think Sorry, we've got a few more minutes, and you mentioned the, the if my employer asked me to go back on furlough. Well, there was also another question with regard to um, what happens to grievance and disciplinary processes during furlough, um, and I think that, that that question there is, well, does it amount, is that work or is that not work? Um, again, I think it's probably a gray area as to whether um, responding to disciplinary allegations um, or attending a grievance meeting, that I suppose can potentially be work. Um, so it would probably be safer to um, to postpone that until the furloughing until the furloughing period has, has ended. Um, yeah. Yeah, that might be different um, coming back to the questions, what about if there isn't any work after the furloughing period? And, and the scheme at the moment is in place until the 31st of May. Um, it is, if, if the scheme gets extended, it will be possible to, to continue and to extend the furloughing period. But if it is not, and if there isn't any work after, after the scheme has ended, um, yes, it, if the normal redundancy rules apply, it, it should be possible to make people redundant and potentially to commence the redundancy process during the following um, period as well. A couple more, then, as quickly as we can. There's one, would an employer have to continue to pay an employee's car allowance? I think that depends on what the contract says. Yes, and I, I, I'm, of course, employer and the employee can agree that um, the car allowance will not be paid. Um, that it doesn't form part of the furlough wage, though, does it? It does not form, form part of the furlough wage. Um, if it doesn't get paid, um, it doesn't need to be taxed either. So if the car is not used for any business reason anyway, um, I think both parties might 
might be prepared to agree um, that milk car allowance will be paid during the following period. I think that brings us to the end um, of our session today. Thank you very much, Joe. That's been a really um, interesting conversation, and I hope that our attendees and viewers um, enjoyed it as well. Um, we have recorded this session, and um, it will be converted into a YouTube link, and it's going to be sent out to all the registered attendees. Um, and the link will also um, appear on, on our website. Um, and I would also like to refer you to our website. We have a coronavirus hub there um, with lots of interesting articles. And of course, if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact us and we would be delighted to assist you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm really sorry that we didn't get to everybody, but hopefully you will find some of the information that you need on the hub. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.